be harnessed for energy that's good for the earth, renewable, sustainable, and safe. But wind can also be really scary. A few years ago, you might remember there was a tornado here that mostly hit East Greensboro. It destroyed a bunch of buildings and people spent a lot of time and energy rebuilding. It was very scary. Sometimes people get hurt. This is water. You need water to live. You are mostly made of water, every one of you. We enjoy it, we play in it, we drink it. All our food needs water. Water sustains life. It is because we are a planet that has water on it that there is life at all. But water can also do really serious damage. This is a hurricane and it can destroy a lot of things, cities, homes, Sometimes people die in storms that are this big and this dangerous. Sometimes people go into years and years and years of debt when all of their stuff, their homes are destroyed in really, really big storms. Water can be really dangerous too. This is fire. We use fire to cook. right here to light my chalice, to stay warm in the cold, to heat our homes, to make things. But fire can also burn things up and destroy them. It can be really, really dangerous. There are a lot of things that are like this, a knife, is like this, for example. It can be a weapon that's used to hurt people or a tool to cut food or make other useful things. Science and scientific discovery, scientific innovation, that's like this too. Scientific discovery has given us medicine to keep us well, to keep us healthy, chemicals to clean things, to make water safe to drink, and vaccines to keep us safe from COVID. But also, it has given us fracking and other methods of extraction of resources that hurt the earth, it has given us the atomic bomb, which hurts people, chemicals used in war, that hurt people, um, various kinds of uh, pesticides or other chemicals we put into the earth that hurt birds and bees and insects and us when we eat the food they grow in. And religion is like this too. People do really, really good things because of their religion and also really bad things. And for Unitarian Universalists, it's really important for us to tell the truth about when we have done the wrong thing because of our religion. And we wanna be a church together that learns how to do the right thing. So all of these things water, fire, knives, tools, scientific discovery, religion. These are a part of life and they're very powerful. Some of them are in nature, naturally occurring without human beings. And some of them are a part of the creative and um, storytelling power of what it means to be a person. And so for the ones that are in our control, the ones that we have some say in how they happen and how they get used, it's really important to use them for justice and kindness and the sort of power that helps people and does not hurt them. 
So now Lynn Johnson will lead us in our meditation hymn. Good morning, everyone. We're going to sing a slightly different version of, of Alleluia than we heard at the beginning for our meditation hymn. And um, it's two lines with four words in each line. All of the words are Alleluia. And I will um, teach it call and response one time through, and then we'll sing it together. Um, if you want to just listen, that's fine too. So good to be with you this morning. Um, the first line. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Together. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. It goes down a little bit at the end of the first line. The end of the second is a little different. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was the first line. So we're going to do the second line again because I sang the first line. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, again, Alleluia, 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 so we'll just sing it through a few times, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Beautiful. Thank you, Lynn. In the before times, I used to go on bars to go, I used to go to, into bars to go on dates. And I would get some version of this question nearly every first date. So, how uh, religious are you? And that question, especially on a first date with someone I don't know at all or don't know well, who has just learned that I'm a minister, does not mean what it says. It's actually a coded question about a certain set of behaviors do I drink alcohol? 
Do I swear? Am I waiting until I get married to have sex? It also might mean, am I prejudiced against LGBTQ people? And if I date this person, would I expect them to convert? That's really what that question means. Here's some things I wish it meant. When people ask me that question, you know, in coffee shops or concerts or all these places we used to go and see each other. So what's your experience of the divine? How strongly does your relationship with the spirit that animates all life shape your daily living? How does that experience of the holy heal you? How does that healing lead you to treat other people? And what does your religion teach you about what human beings are like and what human beings are capable of and what human beings deserve? How do your decisions about your habits flow from the values instilled in you by your church? Are you a member of a community that teaches those values and that encourages a relationship with the divine mystery, a community that's a place for care and celebration and mourning and accountability and transformation and beautiful music and wonderful food? Do you know that you're supposed to be grateful for the gift of life, that you're supposed to give your money away, that you're supposed, you're supposed to feed people? Now, if a man from the internet had asked me those questions in a bar, I might have proposed on the spot. But of course, it is not the fault of these men who have gone out with me and now serve as unwitting and anonymous sermon illustrations. It is instead the intense preoccupation of certain religious communities with controlling people's bodies, justifying cruelty and dehumanization in the name of faith and in the name of God. And it is the failure of religious communities like ours and others to boldly claim and proclaim that our religion is as important in our lives as religion is in the lives of the Koch brothers funded religious right. And it is our religion that teaches us what justice looks like and strengthens us to work for it. It is not a hobby. Add to this, that we Unitarian Universalists, whether we like it or not, inherit a tradition that has at times resisted and at times participated in the project of dehumanization in the name of religion. Religion is value neutral. It was people who called themselves Christians who stormed the Capitol. And it's people who call themselves Christians who throw themselves into growing mutual aid networks, feeding the poor and tending the sick, building grassroots multiracial democracy. At every strike, there are people who call themselves Christians on both sides of the picket line. It was people who called themselves Christians who persecuted Jews throughout history. And it was people who called themselves Christians who smuggled Jews to safety at great personal risk. People who called themselves Christians who enslaved other human beings. People who called themselves Christians who hid them and helped them escape. People who called themselves Christians who were the descendants of those enslaved for whom religion became an empowering and essential force on the long road to freedom. Now, Unitarian Universalists are not Christian anymore, though we come from two historically Protestant denominations, and some of us still claim the Christian tradition. Nonetheless, we worship on Sundays, and we have a responsibility for the, our ancestors of spirit and for the hurt that the church has caused. Unitarians and Universalists have been white enslavers and have been abolitionists of all races. 
We have ordained women and silenced them. We have supported reproductive justice and we have wondered what all the fuss is about. We have dropped bombs and we have opposed the dropping of bombs. We have celebrated and affirmed people of all sexualities and we have hurt them too through dismissal or latent prejudice or wishing they would just be quiet about all that stuff. Religion is not good or evil. Religious traditions help us discover meaning. They give life shape, texture, sense, and habit when all else fails. Religious traditions develop the world over throughout history. It is safe to say that the human creature has a religious impulse, whether or not a particular person belongs to a particular community or institution or tradition. And this is just like human beings aren't good or evil. We are mostly hairless, pretty anxious, bipedal mammals with bra brains too big for us and the use of tools at our disposal. We are not perfectible. We are teachable. We are capable of extraordinary cruelty and we are capable of extraordinary tenderness. There is possibility in us, just like there is possibility in everything we create. I remember going to church basically every Sunday of my life to the River Road Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Bethesda, Maryland. And these words have come out of my mouth, especially during my teenage years. My preemptive justification, oh yeah, I go to church, but it's not that kind of church. I'm not really that religious, I have said. Because in the church of my childhood, and I think in the era of Unitarian Universalism in which I was raised, we were more concerned with distancing ourselves from the harms done in the name of religion partly out of genuine horror and a deep conviction that those things are wrong, partly to pretend to ourselves at all costs that we were the good ones, that those things were somebody else's problem, that it was most visibly the Christian right that was hurting people with its obsession with abortion and sexuality and hell, and we certainly weren't them. We were quiet and embarrassed about our religiousness. We allowed this well-funded, well-publicized hatefulness to bully us out of counting ourselves as religious people. And two, we too often distance ourselves from our responsibility to make repair. Now there are two guesses at the origins of the word religion. And this surprised me because I have heard um, just the one talked about. I have heard this one talked about, the one that traces its origin to the Latin word religare, having to do with binding together. So that definition is taken to be that which ties believers to God. But the other one is connected to the Latin word religere, to read over again. And that one is taking to mean painstaking observance of rights. So in each of those definitions, one of them is about a relationship and a belief, and another one is about habits. Unitarian Universalist thinkers have gravitated toward the first definition with some questions about the part about God. Protestant theologian Paul Tillich called religion a matter of ultimate concern. So whatever the most important things are, those things are the stuff of religion. The late Bill Murray, author of Reason and Reverence, Religious Humanism for the 21st Century, uh, not Bill Murray the actor, but Bill Murray the Unitarian Universalist minister, says this on the subject. If religion is equated with belief in a supernatural deity, religious humanism cannot be considered religious. But while such a definition of religion is popular in the United States, it's not universal. 
Confucianism, Taoism, Zainism, and some forms of Buddhism, for example, are not theistic. So it's very important to know a couple of things. Scholars of religion do not at all agree on what religion is. And the very word religion in English comes to us from French and before that from the Latin used by early Christian writers who were not attempting to describe what all religion is because they did not know, but simply their own. I am not a scholar of religion. And unless you are, you might depart these purely intellectual preoccupations seeking after the correct and universal definition of what religion actually is for this practical set of questions. What are the important components of religious life for Unitarian Universalists? And how shall I live? We live in three dimensions, three relationships. Someone who knows more than I will tell me about all of the dimensions. So let me rephrase that. We live our spiritual lives in three dimensions, in three relationships. We have a relationship to this tradition, to its history, both proud and ugly, to the people who came before us and asked the questions that shaped this house of the spirit, and to those who will come after us, who will inherit the questions we ask and the repair we make or fail to make. This is a relationship throughout time to tradition. We have a relationship to something larger than ourselves, however we name it, and know it. The spirit, God, creation, the universe, the cosmos, the great mystery, gravity. This is a relationship that transcends time. And we have a relationship with beings, people, animals, the earth, ourselves, neighbors, strangers, enemies, and our tradition teaches us values and habits which shape how we treat those beings. Or, as is the case for many of us, our tradition confirms the deep values which we have known in our hearts to be right, which we have allowed to guide their, our lives until the day we hear them confirmed and echoed in a church. So this relationship with all beings is our covenant. At the end of our affirmation, we say, thus do we covenant with each other and with God. Over the next two months, we're going to explore the promises and the perils of liberal religion. We call ourselves inheritors of a liberal religious tradition. And we use that word liberal not to mean people who vote Democrat but to invoke that sense of freedom at the heart of our faith, a freedom which was, at the time this term originated, concerned with civic freedoms and free thinking, and which has evolved through the, those hundreds of years to imply also the necessity to work for physical freedom, for spiritual freedom, for liberation for all people, for systems that free us, not just individual freedom, but the kind of freedom that is only possible when justice comes. So the sense of freedom at the heart of our faith means a few things. And one of them is this free choice to live in accordance with our deepest values not through threat of punishment or hellfire, but because this is the stuff of life, to cherish the ways that we are bound to one another, even when they're difficult, even when they're painful, to chase and invite the holy into our lives, even when it upends us, and to accept the burden and the blessing of a long, long line of people who did the same. 
It is these three dimensions of relationship, tradition, spirit, and covenant that guide us in our living. It is ours to be strengthened by tradition and to make repair for it. Ours to be nourished and humbled by the great mystery that we reach for and we sometimes feel reaching back. And ours to be held in covenant with each, with each, with each other and with all that is, utterly and connected, flawed and failing and trying again because nothing is promised, but mercy is found in every morning until the day we die. May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen. I invite you now to join us in singing our hymn number six in your gray hymnal. Just as long as I have breath, the lyrics will be in the chat. Disappointment pierced me through 